Tina Mana, Tina Iwi, Tina Koto Katoa, Te Fare Wananga Rawaitaha, Tina Koto. Tina Huna Mate, Haere, Haere, Haere. Puki Atu Kito Huna Ora, Tihe Mori Ora. Ladies and gentlemen, we must remember our past, acknowledge and respect those who have created our world. And when I think of that, I'm reminded of what Tartipani O'Regan said to me nearly eight years ago when I first came to the city. And he was a great one for stories. And we were talking about Christchurch. And we were talking about a city, a city that was built on a swamp. And Sir Tiffany told the story of how his forefathers were somewhat bemused by this. For they had some respect for the sailing ships that the colonials arrived in. For the Maori understood navigation and seamanship. But sitting on a hill, they could not understand why these people would choose to build their homes in a swamp. <laughs> but they discovered after some learning that these were people who had sent and spent six months in the sea to get here. They must like being wet. <laughs> the reality of our environment must inform our choices about how we think about our larger Christchurch city our wider part in the Canterbury region, as well as the specific needs of our central district. That we need to find and inform ourselves of a sustainable way to recreate that which has come apart. But mainly we have to recognise that many of the underlying things that cause there to be a city of 300,000 people on the Canterbury Plains, Many of those things have not changed. The wind blowing from the west caused the rain in the highlands that causes the rivers to flow. We live on a plain. We knew it was a swamp. We know it is at or near sea level. We now know it is on an active fault. That is new knowledge. We wish it were not so. To deny it is rather feeble. It needs to be the case that we think, though, that cities are about people and human capital. That what attracted and caused 300,000 people to stay here was not a lack of choice, was not that they could not leave. It is that they came and chose to stay. What was it that caused us to want to be here? In part, it is because this is the gateway to the South Island of New Zealand. A million people still live in the South Island of New Zealand. We are the largest single urban centre by a factor of three or four. We still are. We will be the gateway to the great South Island, the great playground of hinterland, the wealth and prosperity that that island does and will generate. But we are more than just a port and an airport we're a group of people who valued knowledge and learning. Our Maori forefathers valued knowledge and learning. They were curious about these white folk who arrived. They adopted their techniques and their tools. When the colonial forefathers arrived, they brought with them schools and universities at the very founding of the city. They had a vision of society and a community that was well educated and through that knowledge was able to make choices. It is the human capital that will define our city as it has in the past, as it will in the future. It is the human capital that underpins our knowledge-based industries. It's why I, eight years ago, came to this city, drawn by the software sector. But many others have been brought and will stay because we can create businesses that underpin jobs, that underpin family life, that create the activity that must underpin a city. We need to ensure that when we create our sustainable city, 
It is sustainable environmentally, socially, and economically. It is important that we create more value than we consume. It is very important that we create things that are worth more to those who come here than they cost to produce. It is very important that we do that in a way that engages and connects communities and families. I think it is important to remember that often a natural disaster merely reveals the underlying trends in all their stark reality. The reality was that our central district was struggling to retain businesses. It was struggling to build a residential population. Out of 300,000 people living in the Greater Christchurch, 8,000 choose to live in the central district. We have to be very careful that we don't assume that people's ways will change just because we think they should. There are many very, very pleasant places in the hinterland of the CD, the central district. They, those villages and communities, are still in many cases well served by their local infrastructure. And that is not to deny the enormous amount of work that must be done in some other parts of the city. I think we need to think carefully about what has not fallen down. This city is actually open for business. We have a stunning new international airport. The AMI Stadium will be back in business in February. The university is currently running over 2,000 courses for 15,500 enrolled students. It's open for business. And all over the city, we have more pubs and activities than many other New Zealand provincial towns and cities will ever have. So while we may regret our loss, I think we must tell the rest of the world and the rest of New Zealand what is here now, what has survived an extraordinary event. As the Mayor said earlier, we will build a safer city now that we know what we built on. But we need not scare the world away. We need not discourage tourists from visiting. We need not define ourselves by what happened on February the 22nd. We need to be defined by our response to that, by what we now do next, about the priorities we set. We need to acknowledge the uncertainty that prevails all of our lives, that there is unknown information that will become knowable, and there is some information which is unknowable. And we all like more rather than less certainty. We all rather avoid ambiguity. But we need to create a community that can be resilient in the face of the unknowable. That can use science and evidence to turn the unknown into the known. That the human capital that is so important for our city has an enormous contribution to make and a vast opportunity in front of us. There is no doubt that we will, over the next three to five years, have a disproportionate opportunity to think about the human geography of our community, to think about the built infrastructure of our community, to rather deeply scrutinise how we make choices and set priorities. And all of that will make us a better and stronger community when it comes to the next rounds of choices that must be made. We need to be informed by underlying realities. The reality of climate change. The prospect that parts of the city are at or near sea level. These are facts that would, should and need to inform decisions that we make. The reality of some of the ground on which we have built in the past and often successfully for 100 years. Now may not be sensible places to have more than wetlands and green spaces. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the TED experience is an opportunity for your thoughts to be stimulated by the words of others. But in the end, it is the deeds that follow the thoughts that shape and change the world around us. That there are parts of this great city which have not been broken. 
Its spirit has not been broken. Its human capital is intact. Its aspiration to be a great city is undented. We need to engage in an appropriate conversation that leads to timely decisions so that when our children look back, the defining moment was not the 22nd of February when things fell down and lives were lost. The defining moment was when we understood the importance of knowing the real question is not what can your city do for you, but what can you do?